Hey folks, it's Rob, and welcome back to my series on the Dungeon Master's rulebook from the Dungeons and Dragons basic rule set from 1983. Uh, today we're going to carry on <clears throat> into our multi-part series here, uh, where we're going to get to uh, monster descriptions and the monster list, right? Page 24, we're actually in the middle of the freaking book. You can see the staples right here. These are staple-bound books. <clears throat> you know, nowadays seem kind of flimsy compared to, like, you know, the kind of hardcover kind of books like you buy nowadays. But uh, put it in a little bit of perspective, you know, like uh, this... Uh, sorry, this is a recent acquisition. It's still in the plastic, and I just th thought to grab it. Uh, these are about... Um, Eight years previous, uh, I bought a lot, right? Uh, so it came with expansion, Supplement 1, Greyhawk, and Supplement 4, uh, Gods, Demi uh, Demigods, and Heroes. And I actually owned a copy of this when I was a little one because I bought it for like five bucks at Zenith Hobby Shop because it was on the clearance reduction box. <laughs> uh, but I don't have that anymore. I have this. these I just picked up recently. Uh, and <clears throat> those are the only ones of that edition, uh, only books of that edition I have. I don't have the rest of the white box uh, or you know, the wood grain box. It depends on who you're talking to and what, what how they grew up talking about. I grew up with the white box, uh, but the box had a wood grain effect on the outside of it, is my understanding. I've not actually handled one in person, so... <clears throat> And before the internet, we just kind of talked to each other about this kind of stuff when we would meet up, right? Um, like, I used to go to Gen Con on a pretty regular basis because I lived in Chicago, and it was just 100 miles north. So me and my friends would go to Gen Con. And, you know, we back in that day, we would talk about the white box set. Um, but basically, it's before first edition advanced Dungeons and dragons is just dungeons and dragons and it's basically what grew out of chain mail and it's a whole big thing with dave arneson and gary gyax and you know uh, there are a lot of videos you're on the internet and on youtube you know where to look so where we left off uh to stop our massive tangent is mon we're going to get into the monster descriptions which are here so this is just like you know the actual listings they're functionally the monster manual of this set, right? And uh, this is how we can interpret all the statistics we are about to go through, right? So, monster descriptions. Each entry on the following pages has a description of the monsters, often including notes on their behavior. A list of details is given above each description. These details are called the statistics for that monster. They are always given in the same order. The consistency does help, right? Name. If the name of the monster is followed by an asterisk, then a special or magical weapon is needed to hit that monster. You should use these monsters with caution. They are very dangerous to low-level characters, which is very true. I mean, unless they're equipped to defeat the monster and... Uh, Really, the only way you should be using it is because it's either not hostile for some reason, or it's clear to the characters in the party that they should flee. Because they're not going to be able to defeat the monster. In which case, that's up to you as the dungeon master to convey to the, cust to, to the players, right? If you're going to throw a white at a bunch of first and second level players why but if you're going to do that make it sure that that big bad is conveyed to the players that this is a high risk high danger you should run kind of situation and that can be difficult for you to impart to certain players who may be oblivious or maybe gung-ho or maybe not care and want to get it over with <sighs> although if that's the way your session's going <sighs> Armor class. This number is based on several things, including the toughness of the creature's skin, its speed or agility, and armor worn, if any. 
The DM may adjust the AC for special situations. For example, a hobgoblin is normally AC6, probably wearing leather armor, but maybe change to AC2 if plate ar mail armor is somehow found and used by the creature. And again, remember, in this edition, armor class is descending, not increasing, with uh, better armor is a lower number, possibly even negative number. Hit dice. This gives us the number of eight-sided dice used to find monsters' hit points. Read the full description of hit dice on page 22 if you uh, f be sure you understand the term. If an asterisk appears next to the hit dice number, the monster has a special ability given in the description. Two or three asterisks may be given, one for each special ability. Special abilities affect the number of XP earned for defeating the monster, as explained on page 12. And it does dramatically increase uh, the value of a monster for experience. But not as much as, say, like the treasure they may have. Uh, and again, the eight-sided dice, right? These kind of like pointy knot cubes, right? <laughs> um, move. Move. This gives a movement rate for the monster. The number of feet the monster moves in one 10-minute turn is given first, followed by the movement rate per round for encounters. Some monsters have a second movement rate. The first is the rate given when walking, and the second is a form, special form of movement, such as swimming, flying, climbing, right? Uh, to use a more proper technique, uh, I mean, climbing could be just so while it's climbing, there's also like brachiation, which is like kind of tra using your arms to tra travel through the limbs of the, you know, the, the, the branches of the forest. But, you know, maybe they like turn gaseous and they fly, right? Vampires do that, right? They can turn gaseous and they can fly that way. Um, uh, attacks. This gives the number and type of attacks which the monster can use in one round. Um, you know, then that can be a multiple number and it can be broken up with like various attack types. Like you might see one to four slash one to four, uh, damage. If a monster hits the tar hits a target, damage is inflicted. The amount is given, given here as a range. When a monster has more than one attack in a round, the attacks and damages are given in the same order by weapon means that the monster always attacks with a weapon. You know, if it's holding, say, like a dagger or a two-handed sword, right? You would just use the damage type of that particular weapon. Damage is either 1 to, one to 6, or if variable weapon damage is used, again, this is an optional <laughs> rule, uh, determined by the weapon type. So if you're not using that optional rule, it's just 1 to 6. Like, like always, like everything, right? Bam. Five points, right? Um... Number appearing, no dot appearing, right? That's a common old abbreviation for number. The first range of numbers given here shows the number of monsters normally found in a dungeon room. If zero is given, the creatures are nor normally found in a dungeon. The second range, in parentheses, gives the number found outdoors in wilderness. This also is the suggested number of monsters in a dungeon lair. If the wilderness layer, five times this number is suggested. If zero bracket is given, the creature is not normally found outside of dungeons. If a monster is found on a dungeon level different from its hit level, that is hit dice, the number appearing should be changed. This is explained fully on page 22 in the number of monsters section. That was in a previous video if you want to go back and go over that again. And don't feel terribly bound by that guidance, I will say, as a DM myself. Um, you know your party size and what to throw at them and what also makes sense for your campaign. And some things aren't meant to be assailable by the party as they are currently. So, you know, if it's a large goblin tribe out in the wilderness, I don't expect your second level characters to be able to do much about like you know 300 goblins living in a village in a small in a, some kind of settlement right uh, maybe they can sneak in 
Maybe they can. Go, maybe it's a big stealth thing. But are they going to exterminate 300 goblins? How? With what? Cyanide in the water? Um, <clears throat> save as. The saving throw numbers for monsters are the same as those for character classes. Saving throws for all classes, including higher level characters and normal men, are given on page 49, which is way further into the book. Um, basically the back, inside back panel, right? So, <clears throat> morale. This is the number, is the suggested morale of the monsters. Morale is an optional rule explained on page 19, which is used in combat to determine whether the monsters run away, surrender, or fight to the death. Um, and morale is a very useful and practical part of the game, I feel. You should definitely consider using it. Treasure type. To find the treasure guarded by the monsters, compare the letter given here to the letters on the treasure type's chart. Pages 40 to 41. Complete instructions for using the chart are given on that page. Nil indicates no treasure. If a treasure type is given in parentheses, this is the treasure carried by the monster. If the two treasure types are given, the first in parentheses is the treasure carried, and the second is the treasure in the monster's lair. If no parentheses are used, the monster carries no treasure. So it's just lair treasure, right? Now, um, like what a layer consists of varies by depending on what you're talking about, right? You know, is it, is it like uh, the goblins layer, a bandit layer, uh, or is it like a giant snake, right? The giant snake defeated as the first creature defeated in the solo adventure, its layer was that cave, and it was just the one monster, right? Um, Meanwhile, you might, you know, find an entire layer of goblins in the dungeon on a different floor than on the first floor, right? Alignment. Monsters may be lawful, neutral, or chaotic. Again, this is only the three-step alignment system we have here. Animals are usually neutral. A good dungeon master always considers alignment when playing the role of a monster. Only intelligent monsters can speak an alignment language. So, like, you know, while animals may be neutral, they don't speak neutral language. They don't have language. They are animals, right? Um, part of what defines what an animal is or an insect is this inability to communicate, right? But you may have speak with animals, as a spell later on in the game. XP value. The experience points to be awarded for the defeat of one of that type of monster are given here. However, the DM may give more XP for monsters in tough encounters, such as an attack on a well-defended lair. See page 12 for more details on XP awards. And again, yeah, you may want to like just be like, okay, for defeating the goblin lair on top of, you know, just the what goblins you managed to kill, Here's another 100 XP or whatever you feel is fair to award for the situation. Description. A general description of monsters' habits is given below its statistics, including details of any special abilities or behavior. The following terms may be used. A carnivore is a creature that prefers to eat meat and does not usually eat plants. Uh, herbivore is a creature that prefers to eat plants rather than meat. An insectivore is a creature that prefers to eat insects rather than plants or red meat. An omnivore is a creature that will eat nearly anything edible. A nocturnal creature is normally active at night, sleeping during the day. However, dungeons are often dark as night, and a nocturnal creature may be awake during daylight hours if found in a dark dungeon. A monster's home is called its lair. Most monster lairs are in dungeon rooms or outside, hidden in the wilderness. Most monsters will defend their lairs fiercely. So, you know, those are all real terms. Uh, so if you're new to this, welcome. Um, but, you know, it's uh, when I was 10, that was information, right? And But it's, it's real information, and I like that about this, 
right? You know, it's not all just made up gobbledygook. It's sometimes where you're drawing on the real world and using that nerdy kind of knowledge to be able to express it in entertainment as a fantasy world, right? Makes the world more real in some ways. Uh, monster list. So, the actual descriptions of monsters. And some of this is going to have entries like this first one here, where animals, normal and giant sea, ape, baboon, bat, bear, boar, cat, ferret, rat, shrew, or wolf. So, you know, those are some example animals in the book. And we get to start with ant, comma, giant. So, you know, giant ant. Has an armor class of three. That's actually quite hard for beginning character uh, players. Hit dice four. So four of these bu these bad boys. But it's also got an asterisk. It's got a special ability, right? And its move is 180 feet um, outside the dungeon and in an encounter 60 feet per round. It will catch up to your party and you can't get away effectively. Um... It has only one attack, but its attack damage is 2 to 12. So you're rolling 2d6. Right? There's 9 points. That's that's a dead fighter. Right? <laughs> that's a dead first level fighter. Number appearing, even more fun, 2 to 8 in the dungeon. Or, if we're above ground or at the lair, 4 to 24. So, you know, if you happen to be in a lair of giant ants... You now face, what, let's see here, we got 19 giant ants, each with four hit dice each. I don't have four d8s to hand. Um, well, here, uh, let's see, 11 plus, oh, nice low roll, plus three. That's 14 hit points just as an example of that particular ant, right? Um, save as fighter level two, morale seven and see below, right? So at least they they have relatively weak morale. Treasure type U and see below. So they won't be carrying any any treasure as, as we said here in the early in this part here. Uh, but their lair will have treasure type U and see below, right? Uh, their alignment is neutral, their animals, their XP values 125 each. So, you know, not an easy monster to deal with early for this early point in your career, career as an adventurer. Giant ants are black ants about six feet long. They are omnivores and will devour anything edible which lies in their path, no reaction roll. Once engaged in combat, they will fight to the death, even trying to cross flames to reach their opponents. The nest layer will always be guarded by four to 24 giant ants. They are legends of giant ants mining gold, and there is a 30% chance that the layer will contain one to 10,000 gold pieces worth of nuggets. So that's on top of the treasure type U. And while the morale is technically seven, once they're engaged in combat, they will not break morale. So maybe you can scare off some, but the one you engage in combat, if that's what you do to scare them off, uh, will not give up. Again, this is an alphabetical list, so I can see why this is here. But this is not the first monster I would be presenting to somebody as a monster like, hey, let, here, let's show you some examples of some stuff to use. <laughs> uh, and then we move to ape, comma, white, uh, which, you know, it's a white ape. We don't have any other apes in this edition of the game so far, right? You know, maybe we'll have other versions of apes later. But... Its armor class is 6. At least you might be able to hit it more readily. It's 15% easier to hit than the giant ant. Uh, uh, it's, again, 4 hit dice, but at least there's no asterisk on there. Its move is 120 feet or 40 feet, so it's about the same as a human being. Um, it's got 2 claws for an attack. Now, it doesn't say up here... Remember, it's a attack 1. That's a bite. The ant is biting you. It doesn't say bite, but... It's not wielding a dagger. It's got it, it's biting you. Um, two claws. The claws are one to four each, right? So while this is a four hit die creature, this is a lot more dealable <laughs> than than that mess of the giant ant, right? Uh, in that 
if it were to get a hand on one of your characters, we rolled 2d4, right? That's seven points. That's a fairly high roll da damage roll for that set. And that's probably a dead character for first level, but it, it, it's possible that a, clear, a, clear, a high constitution cleric or a well-rolled fighter could survive that attack. Uh, number appearing one to six, as opposed to two, you know, two to eight, <laughs> uh, and in their layer two to eight, they save his fighter two as well. They have a morale of seven as well. No treasure, just none, nil. Their alignment is neutral. They're seventy five XP, and that's because they don't have the special abilities like these do, so it's fifty less. White apes have lost their color due to many years of living in caves. They are nocturnal herbivores looking for fruits and vegetables at night. Which, you're going to be like, what fruits and vegetables are we finding in caves? Uh, but if, if creatures approach their lair, the apes will threaten them. If their threats are ignored, they will attack. They may throw one stone per round for 1d6 points each. White apes are not intelligent and are, are sometimes ke are kept as pets by Neanderthals. Bracket cavemen. So there's only, you know, three points for a thrown rock, right? So that's a, a different kind of attack that they could use, and it's only here in the description, and there's nothing from the stat block that's going to tell you that's there. So make sure you fully read the description of a monster before you're using it. And if you need to make notes for yourself, again, like I, I put into my campaign journal a post-it note for any encounter I'm planning on having with like the monster's basic stats and anything I need to know, right? But that's me. Baboon comma rock. So armor class six, hit dice two, move 120 slash 40, attacks as one club slash one bite. A club does one D six, the bite does one to three, number appearing 2 to 12, we're at the lair, 5 to 30. Uh, they save as fighter 2 as well. Their morale is 8. Their treasure type is U. And alignment neutral, XP value is 20, right? It's nowhere near the difficulty or the XP for defeating it. Rock baboons are larger versions of normal baboons and are more intelligent. They are omnivores but prefer meat. They do not make tools or weapons, but will pick up bones or branches to use as clubs. Rock baboons form packs, each led by a dominant male. And this is interesting how the edit goes this way, right? We go up the here. We're not going down this line. Uh, they are ferocious and have vicious tempers. They do not speak a true language, but can use simple screams to communicate warnings and needs. And I have seen people go, well, does that mean that they can speak the alignment language? No, they cannot speak the alignment language. They can't communicate to you with their screams. What they are doing is alerting each other. Or going, I'm in danger, I'm scared, or enemy attack, right? You know, they go, uh, 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 uh. You know I don't want to screech into the microphone. Nobody needs that. Uh, <clears throat> But you know what I mean, right? Now, next up is Bandit up here, and then we go to Bat. So, and Bandit is such a commonly used thing that you would think this would be way more information. Armor class 6, hit dice 1, move 90 slash 30. I'm just going to say slash 30 so I don't have to say, you know, 30 per, you know, 90 feet per turn, 30 feet per round it doesn't make a lot of sense that way anyway why is it that something it takes 10 minutes gets you 90 feet of movement while something it takes you know literally like 10 seconds gets you 30 feet <laughs> but that's how we balance encounters right you know um, attacks by one weapon damage by weapon number appearing one to eight or three to 30 in a layer you know that'd be a That'd be, uh, you know, Thieves of Den. Um, they save as Thief 1. Morale is 8. Treasure type U. So that's they would be carrying U and have in their layer A. And you know, maybe we should get into the treasure type stuff soon. 
I'm going to be bringing that up a lot. And you're probably going to be like, what is treasure type U to begin with? XP values just 10. Bandits are NPC thieves who have joined together for the purpose of robbing others. Bandits will act as normal humans so they can surprise their intended victims. Treasure type A is only found when bandits are encountered in their wilderness lair. Bandits may have an NPC leader of any human character class who is one or more levels of experience greater than the bandits. So, you know, that basically we're describing a kind of a generic thief here. Um, and yeah, they'll be led by a higher level human, right? Um, I think we'll read bat, the full stat block for bat, because there's two kinds of bats. And then we're going to look at treasure for a moment, I think, because I think we're going to want to have a handle on what treasure means, because I can have an understanding what treasure type U and A kind of mean and roughly what the value of that is in a way. But you at home watching this video, if you're not familiar, you're not going to know what the heck treasure type U is to begin with or what treasure type A is or any of this stuff. And we've already seen it come up multiple times and it's going to come up a lot more. Uh, so I think I'm going to make an executive decision here in the middle of the recording. And we're going to finish bat so I can finish page 25. And then we're going to go in over to the treasure section. Because uh, on page 40 and 41, that's important stuff. So um, bat. So on, we have the giant bat and the normal bat. And giant bats and normal bats have the same AC of six. Giant bats somehow have one quarter or one hit point while normal bats have two hit dice. As you can see, we have an error. Normal bats are supposed to be one hit point while giant bats are two hit dice. The move is nine foot slash three foot. So let's just swap these, right? So normal bat, that's what this should say up here, normal bat, should be a nine foot slash three foot movement range, uh, but they fly, right? So that's why they, they just kind of hop along the ground. For some reason, they're gonna continue to hop along the ground for 10 minutes, because maybe they have rabies. Um, nine feet uh but it's 120 slash 40 while they're flying they cause confusion they don't actually like do any damage you can see damage nil number appearing one to a hundred and that it's it's probably their layer right one to a hundred it's the same number here they save as normal men morale is six no treasure unless you value guano i imagine um and hey, maybe if you're one of those people who put introduced gunpowder to your fantasy role-playing system, which definitely is not in this part of the game, at least at this part, uh, maybe guano is worthwhile then. Look it up, kids. <clears throat> uh, neutral alignment, XP5. They're an animal, right? Uh, the nor This would be the giant bat. That's what this should say up here. Again, armor class 6. Hit dice two, uh, should be two. They, their land movement speed is 30 feet slash 10 feet. Their flight speed is 180 slash 60. They do a bite. It's a D4. Um, number appearing one to 10, right? Just one to 10 giant bats you'll find. Um, they save as fighter one. Morale's eight. So, you know, a little more resilient to running off. Uh, no treasure again except probably giant bat guano. Although maybe they have like a different digestive system than regular bats. Who knows? Um, neutral alignment and XP value 20. Bats are nocturnal flying insectivores. They are often live in caves or abandoned buildings and find their way about by echolocation, a type of radar using hearing and echoes to locate objects. Since they have very weak eyes, spells which affect sight, such as light, do not work on bats. However, Silence 15-foot radius spell will effectively blind a bat. Normal bats. Normal bats will not attack men, but may confuse them by flying around their heads. There must be at least 10 bats to confuse one character. Characters who are confused have a minus 2 penalty on their hit rolls and saving throws and cannot cast spells. Normal bats must check morale each round unless they are controlled or summoned. And really, 
controlled or summoned bats are the ones that probably the ones the party is going to be most worried about. But, you know, if they happen to go into a cave and disturb the, uh, a layer of bats and they all come flying out, maybe some are, everyone's confused for a little bit, right? A non-obstacle. <clears throat> Giant bats. Giant bats are carnivores and may attack a party if extremely hungry. 5% of all giant bat encounters will be groups of giant vampire bats. Far more dangerous creatures, XP value 25. The bite of a giant vampire bat does no extra damage, but its victim must make a saving throw versus paralysis or fall unconscious for 1 to 10 rounds. That's, that's round, so if it happens in the combat, you might still recover before the combat is over if it's a low roll, right? This will allow the vampire bat to feed without being disturbed, draining one to four points of blood per round. Kind of like a sturge, which we'll get to. Uh, any victims who die from having their blood drained by a giant vampire bat must make a saving throw versus spells or become an undead creature 24 hours later after death. If the D&D expert rules are used, this may be a vampire. So... <laughs> That, oh, I forgot about that. That's wild. Mm. So, yeah, you're play, turn, turn your character sheet. It's a vampire now. Let's go to the treasure types. And for a quick, just look over, because I'm not going to read the whole thing. I don't, I don't want to take a massive detour here. But you should have an idea what the treasure types look like in the sense of, like, what those letter codes mean. So what we've had so far is just... Three treasure types. Nil, so that's nothing. We're not even coming over here. Uh, U and A. Now, there are group treasure types and individual treasure types. And certain letters are group treasure types and some are individual treasure types. So, for example, the higher end of the alphabet, such as A through O, as you can see here, are group treasure types. And you'll tend to find these in layers, but these also tend to be more generous treasure amounts. Uh, individual treasure types are from P to V. It doesn't actually get to Z in this in this coding system. Um, and will be much smaller amounts of treasure, but these are on a per individual type, right? So U, it's given percentage types. So on a U type, there's a 10% chance of 1 to 100 copper pieces. So that's, again, think of those as pennies. 10% uh, chance of 1 to 100 pieces of silver, nothing an electrum, and this is very handily how this chart kind of folds over like this, so U is the second from the bottom. It doesn't carry down the side here, and I've seen copies of this where, it, you know, it's just been written in here because someone wanted that for reference, uh, but the second from the bottom is 5% chance of 1 to 100 gold pieces on them. So they, they definitely got paid recently, right? And it's all in their wallet. Uh, and then it goes nil, nil. There's a 5% chance of one to four pieces of jewelry. Jewelry is, you're really hitting jackpot there. Uh, and a 2% chance of any one magic item. So a very small chance that there's a magic item on the monster. And... Really, if you want to go with that 2% chance, maybe make that determination before the encounter happens because maybe the magic item found on... Because commonly a type, treasure type U is found on a lot of individual... Um, sometimes found on individual intelligent monsters. And so maybe there's a, they should have access to that magic item. Maybe they are aware, maybe they are unaware of the value or what it is. Maybe it's, you know, or maybe they are because they're, they're, they're carrying it. Right. And if they're carrying it, why are they carrying, uh, say like a potion of healing? Well, that's great. They didn't get to use it. Right. That's fortuitous. We'll just call it that. But if they're carrying a dagger plus one, why weren't they using the plus one dagger? Think about it. <clears throat> try to make things make sense, right? But back over here on treasure type A. So for the group treasure type, you know, and we've got a layer and it's a treasure type A. 25% chance of one to six thousands of copper. 30% chance of one to six thousands of silver. 
20% chance of 1 to 4 thousands electrum. 35% chance of 2 to 12 thousands of gold. And I'm going to remind you that each gold piece is worth an XP point in this version of the game. And again, this folds down to here. And so A is the first one on here. 25% chance of 1 to 2 thousands of platinum, which is each platinum piece is worth 5 gold. 50% chance that there's 6 to 36 gems. 50% chance that there's 6 to 36 pieces of jewelry. 30% chance of any three magic items. Now this is in a layer trove, so those can just be whatever, right? It doesn't have to make sense as to why they didn't use the healing potion or why they didn't use the plus one sword. It's in the trove, right? And it could be, you know, unintelligent monsters that have this trove. It could be found, like, say, for example, maybe, maybe it's a backpack from an adventurer who died here. Try to encourage, you know, don't just go, oh, it's always in a chest. Chests are great. I, I like chests. That, phrasing. Um, but, uh, I can't lie. But, <laughs> um, you know, if you're finding treasure, um, and don't just, don't just roll the numbers and go, well, okay, you guys find, you know, uh, and you know, we got to do percentile here, right? So we'll do a quick generation, right? So copper, 25%. Uh, that was 21. Okay. So we have copper D six, 2000 copper pieces. Just to start are found silver. Any silver? No, because that is 88. Electrum, 20% chance. That is 9. So yes, there's Electrum, D4. 4. 4,000 Electrum. Okay, so we got <laughs> 2,000 Copper, 4,000 Electrum. Um, gold, 35% chance, right? That's a 72, no gold. Platinum. Oh, that went rolling away. But I have a 1 there, so I mean, it doesn't matter, right? It's going to be like some 10 to 19. Uh, so there's platinum. And how do you get 1 to 2? Well, you can either take your D4 and split it in half. we got a 1, so it'll be 1. 1,000 platinum is plenty. Um, gems, 50% chance of gems, right? I just rolled a 5. So there's definitely gems. There's six to 36 gems. That's 66 gems. They're not going to even roll of the gems. There's a ways of determining value. We'll get back to that. Jewelry. 50% chance of jewelry, six to 36. Yeah, 40. Uh, there's, there's jewelry. And magic items. 30% chance. No magic items today. But boy, howdy. There's uh, gems and jewelry. And over here, like gem value, jewelry value right gems range from 10 to 1000 gold pieces each jewelry ranges from 300 to 1800 gold per piece that's a lot of money you, they certainly earned it by defeating you know uh, what was it yeah uh, the whole bandit den right and again bandits are intelligent so you know, try to think about what they got on them if because they have treasure type U individually, right? Uh, right, moving onwards. Me and my ranting and diversions. Hey, it's a bear. It's what, you know, apparently what women would prefer. Um... <laughs> Got black, grizzly, polar, and cave bears, right? That's this whole section here across the sheet. Bees across the sheet. Beetles across the sheet. Then on this page, we go berserker, boar, bugbear, carrion crawler, and then great cat, which is broken up into uh, three types. No, five types. 
Mm. The layout is interesting sometimes. But, you know, this is before heavy computerization. Um, sometimes you just fit stuff in to make it fit in. And, of course, it's not very much art here. And this is really a place where art really would be very helpful. And that is a criticism I can have for this edition of the game, is that art would really bring a lot more to this. I mean, obviously it's a bear, and you can look up what a black or grizzly or a polar or a cave bear looks like, or a giant bee is a giant bee. Uh, you know, okay, but Carrion Crawler has no art here. There's art for Carrion Crawler in this set of books. It's not here, because there's just not space for it. So that's a criticism I would have of this edition. Uh, again, there's other stuff that gets around some of that. Um, like, like this was printed for second edition, right? This is where TSR has more money and wants to do it up right, right? So we got not only art, but we have color art, right? And... These things used to be released as like loosely for a binder and you'd fit in the sheets you need and take them out as you needed. And yeah, the, the people like books. Um, you lose sheets. They get the things get torn rather than ring the ring binders. I do have a ring binder actually uh, for Monstrous Compendium um, uh, over there somewhere. Uh, but We'll come back to this. This is the Mistara edition of the Monstrous Compendium Appendix. And <clears throat> I guess I've been ranting and talking a bit long already. Uh, we'll pick up Bear next time. But uh, thank you all for watching and listening to me talk about all this stuff. I really do appreciate it. Um, it's been very fulfilling to see your comments and responses and uh, anyone who drops a like is always appreciated. I, 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 I'm very thankful that you are here and listening to me just babble on about stuff I remember from 40 years ago. Um, thank you all again, and I wish you a great day. Goodbye.